why I use RODI water for all of my fish tanks and how to do it right. Some people think that RODI water is only for saltwater tanks, but that's not really true. As you can see, this tank right here is thriving and I attribute a lot of that to RODI water. If you go back in my catalog, you can see another video where I talk about this is killing my plants and it was the water. And it's understanding that mineral balance and what your tap has to offer you is gonna make that decision if RODI water is right for you or not. And what is this all about and how to set up your water. So first you gotta take a look at your tap measurement. And one thing that I use is a TDS meter. These are cheap, you can find them on Amazon really cheap. And TDS just stands for Total Dissolved Solids and it's everything that's dissolved in the water. So you can get a water report from your local water authority that tells you what's in the water, but that's a general at the time of that reading, and that will change with the seasons. Also, your water hardness, your GH and your KH, your carbonate hardness, will also fluctuate through the season, never mind issues with your water being chloramine or chlorine and if they're going to be doing a flush maybe you didn't know about it this is all going to get taken care of through an RODI system. So let's talk a little about what is an RODI water system and what does it really stand for? Well let's break it down. The first two letters RO stands for reverse osmosis. It's a process that's using a set of filters in order to filter out a majority of what's in the water. So in most systems, and in a system like mine, it's first going to start with a sediment filter to remove any sediment from the water. The next stage in there is going to be a carbon filter to remove any chlorine or chloramine and basically get rid of any of the harsh chemicals that you're running into initially. And then the final stage is going to be the RO filter or reverse osmosis filter, which is a really, really tightly wound I don't want to call it a mesh, it's almost like a paper. If you look online, you can see cross cuttings of the filters, get a better idea of what it actually is inside. But the idea is that forcing the water at pressure through this membrane will separate about 95 to 98%, depending on your filter. There are some things that it can't be removed in these stages, and we'll get into that in a minute. But for the most part, you're gonna have water that is coming out pretty much pure and really probably would be fine for your tanks, but it still has ammonia and I'll explain why in a minute. So back to what I was talking about with the RO filter is that as you force this water through the membrane, there will be a waste side of it too. So it puts out pure water and a waste water. Now waste water is a meaning that it's not been purified like the RO output side is, but that water is absolutely usable for your home garden and around the house for cleaning and stuff like that. So if you don't want to just pump it down the drain and you want to use it, you can. Now the efficiency of your system is going to dictate how much RO water you produce versus how much waste. Most systems start at around four to one, meaning that you're producing one gallon of RO water, you're wasting four. And that could be kind of wasteful for a lot of people and really depends on a lot of factors, pressure, the type of filter system that you're using and so on. So that's something to look into. Now in my system, you can see in the pictures, those two white tubes on the top on the right side are the RO filters and I have two of them on mine in what is called a water saver kit from BRS where I got my system from basically takes that wastewater and puts it again through another set or a second RO filter in order to reduce that. And I run a booster pump so I can get my pressure up to 80 PSI. And what this does is that it increases the output of the system plus reducing its water waste. I'm at basically a one to one. I produce one gallon of waste for every one gallon of production. I can make about uh, I'd say about 250 gallons in 24 hours if I needed to. I use uh, these 33 gallon brute cans and they're on wheels, they're on casters. This one's empty at the moment. This is my wastewater one. So I pump my tanks wastewater into one and then I pump out of my other tank, which I'll show you in a minute that is the one that I fill and I never confuse the two of them. You'll see the other one has a level float in it and stuff like that, but basically keeps that one clean all the time. So now that was the RO, reverse osmosis, but what is DI? The deionization is basically a positive and negative charged 
media, media beads, if you will, that attract ions of a negative and a positive charge. They're set up in an order, and there's a couple of different ways to do this. Now, I'm running the big kahuna, seven stage system, extra RO filters with a booster pump. You don't need to do all that. I'm a little crazy, I'm a little water nuts, but I, I want this because it was the most upfront cost, but it is the lowest cost of maintenance. In this system where I have a, I think it's a negative and then a positive and then a mixed bed media, what it does is that it allows it to basically just work on what your water structure has and everybody's going to use it differently. In other words, how fast it uses it up is going to be different depend depending on your water. And needless to say, my water is very inconsistent. We use chloramine, which means that I have ammonia and chlorine mixed together as chloramine. So I'm testing a 0.5 ammonia out of the tap. Plus I'm testing for about 10 to 15 ppm of nitrates. And if you're trying to keep a low nitrate tank, that's a huge problem. The DI stage basically removes anything that was left after the RO system. And like I said before, RO does not remove ammonia. That has to happen in the DI stage. So things like pesticides, ammonia, nitrate would be all removed in the DI side of it. And basically I see about six to eight of a RO output. My input is almost 300 to 330 depends. And so that's just showing you how much it's really removing. I've got the BRS kit, which uses a very good RO filter. I want to say it's rejection rate is 98%. So it does get a lot of the stuff out. If you see the, the wear of the media where it changes from blue to white, this one media is going really fast comparative to the other ones. Basically, I'll probably change that blue media two to three times before I change the first one. I just basically my water structure and then the mixed bed media, which is the final stage is really just a safety catch. If that center stage was exhausted for whatever reason, I wasn't paying attention or whatever, the mixed bed media would basically catch up for that. So that media, I want to say it was about $20 per, per, per cylinder. And, and it really goes a long way. I've, I've made a lot of water, but in the same, everybody's going to be different at how fast you exhaust that media. So what's the catch with RODI water? It's all so easy and so great. The problem is, is that it is stripped and just like me and you, the fish and the plants need minerals too. So when we strip our water down to nothing, we can't just use that plain water. And this is why I tell people do not add RO water directly to your tank. You will see other videos where people are adding their RO water to the tank and then putting the minerals in there. I don't agree with this method. There are other things that we'll get into a little bit later about that. But for the most part, you want to prep your water so that it is the same every single time. I will do 50, 80% water changes on this tank because of the amount of fish that are in it. The bio load is so high that I need to change a lot of water often. And what this allows me to do is that the water I'm putting in is exactly the same every single time. So there is no stress to the fish. Your KH, your carbonate hardness is actually very, very important to a fish's os osmotic balance. An osmotic shock is when that balance is disrupted. And that is the fish's cells being able to stay in balance with the water that they are in. If there is a big difference in those two, osmosis is trying to balance those two, of those two cells in the water that they're in and it can't and it's happening too rapidly or it's too, it's too, too extreme of a difference and a fish will go into osmotic shock. The problem with this is that it's not immediate. You may not see this right away. It could take a week before the fish is actually affected by this. So that's why I'm stressing you really shouldn't be putting stripped water in the tank and then mineralizing it. You really should mix it in a container ahead of time. Now you don't have to do something this big. You could do five gallon buckets if you will. I'm out of the bucket life. I get too much water to change to do buckets, but if you want to, you can mix it in a container, anything you want ahead of time. And we'll go into mixing that in a minute. How you remineralize your water and what you're gonna need. The first thing I'm gonna recommend is that you find yourself a scale. This is a, a gram scale. 
Now, I use this product called Equilibrium. There are plenty of other products out there. There are GH boosters is anything you're really looking for. And GH is calcium and magnesium. Now, Equilibrium has more than calcium and magnesium and Seachem does offer a product that if you don't have plants, uh, I, I can't remember, stability, it may be stability, but I'll, I'll put a, a link in the description if you, if you don't have plants and you just want to do RO water and you just need magnesium and calcium, then you'd use that. But if you have plants, you use Equilibrium and it has other nutrients that the plants or other minerals that the plants will need. And then the second thing we use is alkalinity buffer and this sets your KH levels. Now KH and pH are related but not tied together. So your KH level will set your pH, but your pH will change based on other things in your tank. Wood, mosses, uh, uh, the bio load, how much ammonia is being produced, weak acid, CO2 will all change the pH, but it does not change your carbonate hardness your KH will stay balanced. That's why you can do CO2 and have a daily big swing of pH in the water and it's not harmful to the fish because it's not the KH that's swinging that everybody is talking about when they're talking about don't chase pH. They're talking about KH and a lot of it is really understanding water structure and it can get a little bit complicated but as you learn more and more over time, you'll realize that it isn't really that complicated. And to really think of KH as your trash barrel that holds all the things that would change the pH of the water. And you must overfill that tr trash barrel in order to change the pH of it. So with a tank like this where I'm injecting CO2, I first must overcome the KH in order to have the pH drop and that's why you wouldn't want a very high KH level because then you'd have to inject a ton of CO2 just to fill the garbage can to start the process of dropping the pH which would increase the available CO2 that's in the water. This is a 33 gallon brew can. I want to say I'm about 28 gallons or so and a lot of this is experimentation. You got to do what works for you. But in this can what I'm doing is I'm doing 16 grams of the equilibrium and that'll put me at about five degrees or so of gh and gh if you want to say degrees to tds or parts per million which are exactly the same thing tds and parts per million equate the same way um every one degree is 17.9 ppm so five degrees of gh and then I do six grams of uh, alkalinity buffer, and that'll put me around three, two and a half to three degrees of, of carbonate hardness, which would put me about 6.8 to 7.0 pH. And then total will be about, about 150 is where I'm mixing to. Now you see some people say, oh, go to 100. You know, it, it, it all depends on what your targets are and what you're looking for. I have hard water fish. They need that GH to be up a little higher. For me, this is what I need. But if you read this instructions on the back, it's gonna tell you to put alkalinity buffer in and then a certain amount of acid buffer to set the pH level. This is not necessary what you're basically doing is that you're bringing the cage up and then cutting it back down with acid buffer. So basically it's a waste. Acid buffer for me is if I need to knock down the pH because I mixed it wrong. Uh, if I have some sort of other issue, if I'm using tap water in a different tank, that's a, you know, an experimental tank and I want to reduce, then that's what that's for. But for the most part, you notice it's a very small because I don't use it that often, but I do keep it around just in case I need it. Now, for alkalinity buffer, you can use baking soda. Alkalinity buffer from Seachem has other things in it more than just baking soda, but baking soda will work perfectly fine. So if, you're, if you just don't need any of that stuff and you just want to be able to set your pH or set your KH, should I say, that is a perfectly fine thing to do is use baking soda. I do again highly recommend you're mixing in your container, not in your tank. When I add to this, I dump it in there, 
I have a pump running in there to mix it, but immediately I'll take a reading and I'll be 110, 120. I let that run for about 30 minutes or so to mix everything up. I might have to stir it up a little bit. Um, at that point, it, about 30 minutes it takes for everything to dissolve and then I'll be up around 150. So just adding it to your tank and taking a reading doesn't work. It really needs to be dissolved well into the tank, uh, into, the, into the bucket before you're adding it to your tank. This way to avoid any mishaps or miscalculations of how much you need to put in. Anything you can do to try and acclimate that water to the tank is the best practice that you can do so that there is nothing very extreme change. What if I told you, you never have to buy fish food again, right? Okay, maybe not that extreme, but a live food, a live food culture could really just invigorate your fish and make them super happy again. And we're not talking baby brine shrimp. We're talking about a sustainable food culture. And that's going to be in this video right here.